What? You expected me to be done up all differently? Something akin to this? Who's the real clown now? <laughs> What is up everybody? Random Random Man here, bringing you my review for Joker Folly A Deux, aka Joker 2, in one take. Yes, this is quite a film to talk about, and uh, putting it all together in this one-shot review, as I have done uh, quite a few of recently, I thought was the best way to go about this. So, this is the sequel to 2019's Joker, which I have right here on Blu-ray, and to give you my brief thoughts on this film, I really enjoyed it. I liked it a lot. I went back and rewatched it for the first time since theaters a few nights ago to prepare for Joker 2, and, uh, I think it mostly holds up, and this is a film that was quite different, more grounded as an origin story for this version of the Joker, or Arthur Fleck, as played by Joaquin Phoenix, and just it being so pressing, anti-altruistic, a bunch of stuff put together certainly made this a memorable watch. And this was intended to be a one-off movie until the film premiered at that year's Venice Film Festival, where it won the top prize, The Golden Lion. It made over a billion dollars, becoming the first R-rated movie to achieve that feat, and was nominated for 11 Academy Awards, the most for any movie during that ceremony, including Best Picture, and walked away with a couple as well. So a sequel more or less would have been expected with how big of a financial success that the movie was. And uh, going into it, I had kind of back and forth for moderate expectations. I mean, like I said, this was intended to be a one-off movie until it was uh, revealed that the sequel was going to be a different approach in terms of narrative. And it's a musical, a musical psychological thriller, and also Lady Gaga was cast to be this movie or universe's version of Harley Quinn. And it's like, okay, these pieces were all coming together. And then Todd Phillips, who previously co-wrote, produced, and directed the first film, comes back in all three of those roles for the sequel, as well as Joaquin Phoenix, of course, as Arthur Fleck slash Joker. So with that, this movie followed a similar route to the first film in premiering at this year's Venice International Film Festival, where it got pretty polarizing reactions. The first film was divisive, but again, with all that success it got thereafter, that didn't necessarily matter because the movie was uh, more than a runaway hit. But this year at Venice, the movie got a polarizing reaction, and then more recently, as this movie approached its release, five years to the day of the first film, I mean, wow, that's crazy to think that it was half a decade ago. Yeah, a lot more has been said about this movie that I want to put my two cents into, and, you know, with the space of comic book slash superhero movies as of late, there has been a lot to talk about online. And yes, I know, before I go any further, the irony of me wearing a Captain America shirt while talking about a movie based on a DC property. But in any sense, starting out with the cast and their performances, we have Joaquin Phoenix returning in the titular role of Joker or Arthur Fleck. Now, he went all the way with the first film. He swept that award season and he won the Academy Award for Best Actor. And I thought that was quite a deserving win. And he really embodied the character and what he was trying to do, to do with that kind of portrayal. And here I think a lot of similar attributes apply. He's personally one of my favorite actors working in Hollywood today. And seeing what he did with the first one transitioning to the second one, also bringing in some of his own singing chops into the fray. He's already proven that uh, with a previous Oscar nomination he got for Walk the Line, playing Johnny Cash there. He also won a Golden Globe there. And yeah, just giving this character a lot of reflection and also just seeing how he evolved even with all the consequences of what he did after the first film. So yeah, Phoenix, I, I thought, stood out as well as Lady Gaga at points as Harleen Quinzel, this universe's version of Harley Quinn. 
Now, uh, Harley, or Lee, uh, she is a fellow inmate to uh, Arthur at Arkham, where they're both at. And uh, she, again, seemed like a perfect candidate in terms of the movie being a musical. I mean, I love Lady Gaga. That's why I think she is perfect to play a role like this. You know, singing, also being an actress herself, popping up in quite a few things in the last few years. So with her, I thought her performance was something that was of note when she was there. Not that she doesn't have a ton of screen time per se, but to get into the writing later on, uh, with how her performance is and what we see in the chemistry she has between herself and Joaquin Phoenix, she seems like the kind of person that would be a fit for this universe's version of Joker and uh, what she has to offer in terms of also being an unabashed and, you know, unconditional supporter of this character, all of that, I would say. And then we get into the supporting cast. Some players from the first film do return to this movie, and this is what I get for doing this in one take, yeah. Okay, as I mentioned before, <laughs> I live up the street from a hospital. I live on a main road, whatever. <clears throat> but anyway, so the supporting cast, some of the players from the first film do return, including uh, Lee Gill, who plays a co-worker, a former co-worker of Arthur's uh, named uh, Gary. And uh, with his scene that he has between uh, uh his character and Arthur. I mean, you know, it's one of the standout scenes of the movie when this movie is also part courtroom drama, as I'll get to, and then other players who show up in between. New people that show up here include uh, Brendan Gleeson as this abusive uh, prison guard who really has it in and out for Arthur at points. But, you know, I thought he fit the role. Catherine Keener plays the lawyer to Arthur who's trying to argue for a split personality kind of case in which Joker, his other persona, was the one who committed all those murders in the first film. And uh, that, I thought he, she did well with uh, what she was trying to do too. She's a class act, Gleason's also a class act. I mentioned that for a lot of veteran actors or people who I think have really cemented themselves with a certain kind of status. Steve Coogan plays this, uh, a reporter who interviews uh, Arthur at one point uh, imprisoned and you know I thought he had a nice level of intrusiveness for what he was trying to do with this character also putting on an American accent which uh, I don't think I've heard him in a past movie do but you know I thought that was convincing then there's Harvey Dent yes Harvey Dent who eventually becomes Two-Face of course in the world of Batman and DC Comics uh, played by Harry Lottie who is the prosecution against Arthur in the case and I thought he was fine. You know, he doesn't have that much to do aside from being the natural opposition or just trying to be one of the member berries sprinkled in for this movie's sake uh, to be connected to Batman and whatnot. Even though in the first film, if you recall, Bruce Wayne is a kid and this movie only takes place two years after the first film once we have the Fleck trial going into place. But yeah, so with the cast, there's other people to mention too, but like with the main core members, especially Phoenix and Gaga... I think they are the standouts of the movie, and they do outstanding jobs. And then we get now into the actual story, the writing of this film. As I mentioned, co-writer, producer, director Todd Phillips returns here. He once again co-writes the screenplay with Scott Silver. And with this being a musical, a musical psychological thriller, mixing a lot of different stuff here, and not being a similar approach to the first film, taking quite different step, I thought that immediately made it very interesting to see what would be done here because you have the title in French uh, translating to Madness of Two, Madness for Two. <laughs> My French is awful, but yeah, that's what the uh, <laughs> the title, subtitle translates to. And you would think that with this already being such a dark story extending from the first film that it would be dark within the musical numbers. And naturally it does feel that way in one sense too. And then there's also how this movie feels like an extended epilogue to the first film, not just necessarily a full-blown sequel, because a lot of the first film is referred back to. It's uh, also straight up physically referenced in a lot of frames and a lot of inserts here to see that, you know, there are big consequences for the people that Arthur murdered and also him being behind bars and all this other stuff. And then the romantic angle coming in with uh, him uh, 
really falling for Lee uh, during musical therapy and then both of them striking it up and all this other stuff in between. The movie is also part courtroom drama. A lot of this movie takes place inside the courthouse courtroom where we see Arthur on trial and all these different testimonies, you know, Lee in the background. And that's what the movie amounts to in terms of its structure. It does go back and forth between being a musical, then a courtroom drama. And it kind of goes back and forth in many ways like that. And one would think that it would be jarring with how it switches up that kind of stylings or genre of film in between. And to some that I've seen so far in terms of reviews and thoughts, I feel that, you know, they see it that way. I didn't, but I do think the balance of it, while trying to maintain a dark tone, wasn't entirely sound. I do think that on their own, a lot of the musical sequences do uh, seem to be well intended in trying to fit tonally with the story. I mean, whether they are fantasy sequences, straight up fantasy sequences between uh, Arthur and Lee, I think that they are well staged, they are well done. Phoenix and Gaga were apparently told to sing off key on purpose because it's supposed to be like a scrappy, kind of grungy, uh, grimy kind of uh, feel to the musical numbers and even when it's like a bigger kind of number they only sing marginally better from what I could tell but with that I thought that was something that worked for the movie's favor when you look at it in pockets or individually like that and as a courtroom drama it's a pretty standard courtroom drama with how we see oh yeah the prosecution defense presenting different cases you know talking about evidence you know witnesses testimonies all that kind of stuff here so when it comes together and it going in between, what I think the movie does in terms of being subversive but squanders itself in its total is just that even with all this happening in between, it didn't necessarily feel like we were getting that much more depth or substance with what we already knew of Arthur. And again, this being kind of like an extended epilogue to the first film. With that being said, though, there's a lot of technical elements here that I do have to praise. A lot of people from behind the camera in the first film do return uh, to help make this sequel. Uh, Lauren Scher is the cinematographer who was Oscar nominated for the first film, I believe, I believe. And this movie is quite stunning. There's a lot of great shots here. The movie is very crisply filmed and... Uh, how the movie looks all together and it being dark. I mean, we have a lot of interiors inside Arkham, inside the courtroom, and even some locations from the first film that we do go back to. I think it is all well staged. I do think that it is well set up and blocked all together. The music, the original score by Hilder Gudnadottir, who won the Oscar for Best Original Score for the first film, does return here. Her strings, her very... A uh, kind of stripped down but also effective kind of instrumentation and just going into Arthur's mind. Some reprises from the first film are found here. And the musical sequences, there are some famous songs that are sung by our two leads. And uh, they are well done here. But again, when the movie is further implemented in terms of how the narrative is flowing, I was entertained for sure. But I didn't feel like we were getting that much out of it aside from seeing what could be done in terms of the directing. And Phillips, I think, as a director, I do think he is strong in some of the stuff I've seen before. He's mainly known for comedies prior to these Joker movies. And I feel like he was just doing something that was full stop in terms of like, you know, he was doing something actually nonstop in terms of being different or subverting whatever he was able to do. Because, you know, he took a different approach, a big swing in this being a musical uh, part of the way at least and I do think that feeds into where you connect it to the first movie and it's almost like it's not undoing the first film but kind of seeing how like oh by the end which I'll get to <laughs> it feels like it is something that is backing up the whole realism angle despite the whole fantastical element of it being a musical. It just feeling like, you know, it, it's not necessarily going in the same flow that it would be to have it have anything more to say, I think. I do think it is well cut together in many areas too, editing wise. The running time in terms of the pacing, this is slightly longer than the first film. The first film, I believe, was about two hours and I thought that was well timed. This is about uh, just under two hours and 20 minutes. And uh, 
at times I was feeling it, not because of the constant shifts in terms of what kind of sequences we were getting, but I think in terms of how, again, the movie feels like it's not going into that much more. And that goes with the writing in terms of how we see Lee characterized. Gaga's character, I think, doesn't have that much to her. There are lines in passing in reference to how who she is as a person in connection to Arthur and Arthur hearing all of this too or interpreting whatnot, also phasing in and out of reality. The movie is just very back and forth in terms of doing that because of us trying to fit into the mind of Arthur, but also trying to see how what his actions in the first film did have consequences across Gotham and just the perception of everything altogether, his rabid supporters, everything else, but absolute justice being brought, maybe? I mean, it, it, the movie is just kind of kind of baffling in some ways for me because of what it is doing in terms of that kind of execution. And then we get to the ending. The movie in the final 15-ish minutes or so, it really goes for something. And I'm not going to say it necessarily goes for something that is pure grandeur. I'm also trying not to go into spoilers here. But then by the time it all comes together, by the time the end credits did start rolling, I did hear someone behind me in the theater go, that's it? And uh, I can see why it's pissing a lot of people off with this film. And it just amounting to something that was not very consequential or necessary. It being empty, maybe. I think the way it ends... It did make me go, huh, okay, <laughs> in one way. And at the same time, though, it, it kind of backs up the inner psyche and just the inner character of what Arthur was portrayed as in the first film. And uh, how we see this all come together, yeah, do we really necessarily need a soaker? Uh, soaker, oh my god, I can't talk. This is what I get again for doing a one take. Do we necessarily need a sequel to Joker? No. And when it amounts to it by the end, it doesn't feel like we have anything else more to go off of, aside from maybe Philip saying like, you know, yeah, hey, I was able to do this because the first movie was such an unmitigated success. And he's even said that he's not going back to the world of DC. He's done after these two Joker films, which from how the movie is going to pan out in terms of the box office and how it's really getting railed on by people uh, that have seen it thus far, maybe it is a wise choice. But I can't necessarily fault the movie for being such a big swing in some aspects, in terms of the basis. But then in terms of execution and how I see this movie having come together, I do have to praise a lot of what I saw in terms of the performances. It being in concept something that is so different and not trying to ape off of the first movie completely, aside from implementing a lot of narrative elements from the first film that just back it up. The technical stuff that I've mentioned, all the craft... All of that, I think, is well done. This is a technically well-made movie. But in what it amounts to, is it something I'm necessarily going to watch again? No. I don't think that, you know, it necessarily looks back or in connection fondly to the first film because of what happens by that end. And uh, for a lot of people, that's just enough in terms of, like, seeing these kinds of movies do that. But I still applaud movies like these for even existing or coming into fruition. There's a lot of similarities to what I saw and reviewed last week with Francis Ford Coppola's Megalopolis, A Fable. Yes, I'm going to say that by the whole technical title. I would say that I enjoyed this more than watching Megalopolis, which, you know, even though I found that movie to be mediocre overall, there's a lot of merit to how we see a director's vision singularly, a singular vision, and not having that many notes in terms of it. Although apparently the ending to Joker 2 was changed from what I recall or what I saw online, I don't know. But with these movies having quite a bit in common, the only difference is that, you know, Coppola was just doing something that was more made for him and not for a general audience. And Joker 2, of course, it's a sequel. It's a subversive sequel. And, you know, it's turning a lot of people that love that first film into haters of this sequel, whatnot, stuff all over the place. I don't know. <laughs> to try to make it all summed up well. Again, my thoughts are all scrambled, like I did with my review of Megalopolis last week, even now, because trying to make, uh, to think of what to make of this movie is not entirely, you know, something I would amount to, other than saying that as a movie, eh, it's okay. I do think it is inferior to the first film, just on face value. On a basic front, 
the first film is a stronger movie in it being more basic and uh, going through with the whole kind of arc that Arthur had there. And then here with the sequel, some of it is not much more dived into or just even having something as a connection with the romance angle with uh, this version of Harley Quinn. We don't get that much other than some sequences that I personally found enjoyment in. I mean, I know people are going to groan or just like lament the fact that this is part musical and it going back and forth between it. But the movie wasn't trying to hide in the marketing that it is a musical. I mean, there's moments of them singing and dancing together, all of that from the trailers and posters that I recall. All of that is there. So I guess, yeah, again, film is subjective and it's all about how it falls on you, how it lays into uh, your kind of sensibilities and taste. Also with that, the way in the movie ending, again, no spoilers, there are other movies that are way more artsy fartsy that pissed me off more in being about nothing or summing up to nothing or just being a lot more pretentious and on the nose with what they do and it just being so anticlimactic. So that's why I don't hate this movie on a basic front there too, because I've seen worse in terms of movies trying to be full of more heightened uh, kind of uh, prestige or whatnot. I clearly didn't love this movie either like I did with a lot of the first film. So yeah, ultimately I would say that if you're a fan of the first movie, <laughs> I cautiously recommend it. And you know, you're probably gonna wanna see it as more of a curiosity. The word of mouth about this movie is already getting out and people are saying, stay away, stay away. <laughs> with all the exit scores and all the reactions. Yeah, all of that. If you weren't a fan of the first film, I don't know if this is necessarily going to sway you. I did see a handful of reviews here and there that weren't fans of the first film, but say that they liked the sequel for trying something different. Again, I don't know. This is all over the place, just like my thoughts have been all over the place that I've been talking for way more than 20 minutes by now, so I should just wrap up my time and just uh, go ahead and give my final verdict for Joker Folly Adieu. My final verdict for this film is three out of five stars. And there you have it. Thank you all, as always, for watching. Be sure to like this video, comment on what you thought of Joker Folly the social media links in the description, subscribe to my channel for more, and I'll catch you on the next movie review.